Welcome to the online worship with St. Mary of the Angels. My name is Father Kevin. I am the rector at St. Mary's, and I'm very happy you are joining us. This is Palm Sunday, the Sunday before Easter, and also the beginning of what we call uh, Holy Week. So thank you for joining us. Uh, we are an Episcopal church here at St. Mary's, and Episcopal uh, is a traditional liturgical church, which there's a lot of definitions to liturgy, and one means work of the people, uh, which basically is saying that we're an interactive service. When we do things, there's a lot of interaction in that somebody from the front will say something and the congregation responds. Uh, they're standing and sitting and kneeling and all sorts of different things that take place. Uh, we begin our service by processing in, by walking in, uh, kind of like a parade, almost like Palm Sunday's uh, parade in to Jerusalem. And, and we do a lot of things that are, are physical, outward representations of our inward faith and spiritual life and growth. So that, that's a big part of what our church is. Now, just because other churches and a lot of modern churches don't do things the same way we do them, does not mean that the way they do things is wrong or that they aren't in some ways liturgical churches that are active with the people. And, and the liturgy, when we talk about our Episcopal service, we, we look at what we call the order of service. And what that is, is it's kind of the same way you would have an order of service at a restaurant. There's an order that things come in that uh, kind of help the flow of what a meal is supposed to look like. There's an order of the way things come in a service that kind of leads you to where you're going. In our Episcopal service, uh, we have all sorts of different elements within our order of service that eventually le leads us to communion, and each element builds on another. So we begin our services with, with procession in and a salutation, which is a greeting and a blessing. And we kind of have like our way of saying, let the service begin, which in a way is like a call to worship. A lot of modern churches that don't really follow our tradition in the Episcopal Church or the Roman Catholic Church or some Methodist or Presbyterian churches, they still have a liturgy. They still have a way to kind of gather people together and to bring them through a service to take them beginning to end. And it will, it will look different than ours, but it doesn't mean that it's not as good. It just means it's different. And it is all, all designed to glorify God or at least it should be. So with that, one of the tools a lot of churches will use is what they call a call to worship. And it's kind of what we do with our opening hymn and our salutation and our blessing. It's a call to worship. The very first thing that takes place in any order of worship is you have to gather the people. So the call to worship is almost like a trumpet being sounded saying, hey, now's the time, or bells being rung before church service saying, this is the call to worship. Come together, we're going to worship. A lot of modern churches will do a call to worship and they will use video and audio and all sorts of different resources to kind of bring people into a space and a mood in a place where they are prepared and ready to worship. Well, uh, Adamir, who is a recent addition to the staff here at the church and an amazing godly man, has actually put together a video call to worship this week. So we're going to play it, but the thing that I love about it, that Adamir did with it, is he put together a video that absolutely shows that, especially on this Palm Sunday, that the church is not, nor should it be, limited to the Episcopal branch of the Jesus movement, or the Roman Catholic branch, or the Presbyterian branch, or the non-denominational, or the Pentecostal branch of the Jesus movement, that whatever the branch is, we are all part of the same tree, and that is to be the body of Christ. So the call to worship that Adamer made, I think does an amazing job of showing all types of people in God's creation, and all types of worship and how all of the people and all of the types of worship come together to serve one God. So please do take a moment as we allow the work, the gift that Adamir has given us to call you to worship. In everything that I've breath, praise the Lord. Everything that I breath, praise the Lord. If I have breath, I'm qualified to praise. If you have
have breath, you're still qualified to praise. The trees can praise him. If you have breath, you're still qualified to praise. On a good day, praise. On a bad day, praise. On the mountain, praise. In the valley, praise. When you're feeling good, praise. When you're feeling sick in your body, praise. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yahweh. Yahweh. Only you will answer. Yahweh. Yahweh. Yahweh, only you will answer. Yahweh, say, Yahweh, hallelujah, Yahweh, only you will answer. Yahweh, Yahweh. Now that we've had that call to worship, we will get into our liturgical uh, setting that we do here in the Episcopal Church, which is a salutation. Uh, and with that, we open our service with a prayer. And I want you to have God evident in your life, and I won't hope you want him evident in mine. So I'm going to say the Lord be with you, and I hope you say and also with you, and I'll say, let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, in your tender love for the human race, you sent your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, to take upon him our nature and to suffer death upon the cross, giving us the example of his great humility. Mercifully grant that we may walk in the way of his suffering and also share in his resurrection. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. There's some very cool traditions in the church and, and things that we do. And one of the things we do is this being Palm Sunday, we're going to read the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the passion is basically uh, what we call the final movements, the final days of Jesus's life before death on the cross. So the passion is everything that leads up to that. We call it the passion because it's a representation of his passion. And it begins on Palm Sunday. It begins with his triumphant entry into Jerusalem, even though the people there didn't really understand what they were doing. So one of the traditions of the church is to decorate using palms for Palm Sunday to kind of recreate that, that atmosphere of Jerusalem to help us to remember and focus in on Jesus coming into our lives. But unfortunately, just like the people in Jerusalem back then, even people today misunderstand who and what Jesus is and what he does in our life. And we'll talk about that and we'll read the Passion. But I want to show you one of our traditions. This is a cross. And this cross is actually made out of a piece of palm. And the palm is folded into the cross shape. And we actually got these uh, from a ministry in Africa. Uh, Africa. So, And I don't know which country it's in, but somewhere in Africa, in a country in Africa. And it, it showed me when I ordered it, but I forgot. Uh, a, a wonderful group of people created these palm crosses. And we pass these out on Palm Sunday. 
And the hope is that people will keep them through the year as a remembrance of what Christ has done for them in their lives. But a tradition a lot of people don't know about is we begin the season of Lent with a service on Ash Wednesday. And on Ash Wednesday, we take ashes. And as a priest, I'll rub the ashes and I'll put a cross on somebody's head and say, remember, you are dust and to dust you shall return. Well, one of the cool traditions in the church a lot of people don't know about is where we get those ashes from. What we do is we actually uh, ask people to bring the cross back, the palm cross, the following year, and then we burn that palm cross and muddle it and use that as the ashes to begin our Lenten season. There are so many neat traditions that we do in our church. So thank you for worshiping with us this morning. And I am going to get to the passion and we're going to talk a little bit about it. But before then, please do enjoy this hymn.
Okay, I'm going to warn you, we're going to read the whole Passion. It is two chapters uh, from the book of Mark, chapter 14 and 15. It's a bit long, I, I tell you it is. So please do buckle up, settle in, get comfortable, and get ready to hear the Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ. It was two days before the Passover and the Festival of Unleavened Bread. The chief priests and the scribes were looking for a way to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. For they said, not during the festival, or there may be a riot among the people. While he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came with an alphabet jar, sorry, an alabaster jar, a very costly ointment of nard, and she broke open the jar and poured the ointment on his head. But some there who said to one another in anger, Why was the ointment wasted in this way? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii, and the money given to the poor. And they scolded her, but Jesus said, Let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has performed a good service for me. For you always have the poor with you, and you can show kindness to them whenever you wish, but you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for its burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever the good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went to the chief priest in order to betray them. When they heard it, they were greatly pleased and promised to give him money. I'm sorry. When they heard it, they were greatly pleased and promised to give him money. So he began to look for an opportunity to betray him. On the first day of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb is sacrificed, his disciples said to him, Where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. And wherever he enters, say to the owner of the house, The teacher ask, Where is my guest room, for I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, furnished, and ready. Make preparations for us there. So the disciples set out and went to the city and found everything as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover meal. When it was evening, he came with the twelve, and when they had taken their places and were eating, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be distressed and to say to him one after another, Surely not I. He said to them, It is one of the twelve, one whom is dipping bread into the bowl with me. For the Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to the one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that one not to have been born. While they were eating, he took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, gave it to them, and said, Take, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, and all of them drank from it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many. Truly I tell you, I will never again drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. When they had hung the hymn, when they had sung the hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives, and Jesus said to them, You will all become deserters, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, Even though all become deserters, I will not. Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this day, this very night, before the cock crows th twice, you will deny me three times. But he said vehemently, even though I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all of them said the same. They went to the place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took with him Peter and James and John and began to be distressed and agitated. 
And he said to them, I am deeply grieved, even to death. Remain here and keep awake. And going a little further, he threw himself on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. He said, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me. Yet, not what I want, but what you want. He came and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep awake one hour? Keep awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And once more he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to say to him. He came a third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? Enough! The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Immediately while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. And with him there was a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. So when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi, and kissed him. Then they laid hands on him and arrested him. But one of those who stood near drew his sword and struck the slave of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Then Jesus said to them, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as though I were a bandit? Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not arrest me. But let the scriptures be fulfilled. All of them deserted him and fled. A certain young man was following him, wearing nothing but a linen cloth, they caught hold of him, but he left the linen cloth and ran off naked. They took Jesus to the high priest and all the chief priests and elders, and the scribes were assembled. Peter had followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest, and he was sitting with the guards, warming himself at the fire. Now the chief priests and the whole council were looking for testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. For many gave false testimony against him, and their testimony did not agree. Some stood up and gave false testimony against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. But even on this point their testimony did not agree. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, Have you no answer? What is it that they testify against you? But he was silent and did not answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, Why do we still need witnesses? You have heard this blasphemy. What is your decision? All of them condemned him as deserving death. Some began to spit on him, to blindfold him, and to strike him, saying to him, Prophesy! The guards also took him over and beat him. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she stared at him and said, You also were with Jesus, the man from Nazareth. But he denied it, saying, I do not know or understand what you are talking about. And he went out into the forecourt, then the cock crowed. And the servant girl on seeing him began again to say to the bystanders, This man is one of them. But again he denied it. Then after a little while the bystanders again said to Peter, Certainly you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. But he began to curse, and he swore an oath, I do not know this man you are talking about. At that moment, the cock crowed for the second time. Then Peter remembered that Jesus had said to him, Before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. 
As soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered him, You say so. Then the chief priests accused him of many things. Pilate asked him again, Have you no answer? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further reply, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the festival he used to release a prisoner for them, any one for whom they asked. Now a man called Barabbas was in prison with the rebels who had committed murder during the insurrection. So the crowd came and began to ask Pilate to do for them according to his custom. Then he answered them, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that the chief priest had handed him over. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have him release Barabbas for them instead. Pilate spoke to them again, Then what do you wish me to do with the man you call the king of the Jews? They shouted back, Crucify him. Pilate asked them why, what evil has he done, but they shouted all the more, Crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas for them, and after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers led him into the courtyard of the place, that is, the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole cohort. And they clothed him in a purple cloak, and after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on him, and they began saluting him, Hell, King of the Jews! They struck his head with a reed, spat upon him, and knelt down in homage to him. After mocking him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. They compelled a passerby who was coming in from the country to carry his cross. It was Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus. Then they brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him. And dividing his clothes among them, casting lots to the side what each should take. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. The inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two bandits, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests, along with the scribes, were also mocking him among themselves and saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Messiah, the King of Israel, come down from the cross now, so that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also taunted him. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, Listen, he is calling for Elijah. And someone ran, filled a sponge with sour wine, and put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed, his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was God's son. There were also women looking on from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James the younger and of Joseph. And Salome. These used to follow him and provided for him when he was in Galilee, and there were many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem. When evening had come, and since it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself waiting expectedly for the kingdom of God, 
went boldly to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate wondered if he were already dead, and summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he had been dead for some time. When he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the body to Joseph. Then Joseph brought or bought a linen cloth and taken down the body, wrapped it in the linen cloth, and laid it in a tomb that had been hewn out of the rock. He then rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where the body was laid. survey the wondrous cross on which the prince of glory died my richest gain I count but lost and Content on all my pride. See from his head, his hands, his feet. So. There's a reason they call that the passion of our Lord. And when you listen to it and read it and hear it, I hope that makes sense. There's so much in those readings. There's so much there and there's so many misunderstandings. I was thinking this past week about the difference between what is healthy and what is not. And it really kind of came from a moment of frustration. I had had a bad day and I was frustrated and I got home and my wife, being wonderful, reminded me of one of the chores that is my chore, one of the things that I need to do. And she wasn't being harsh or rude or condemning. She just simply said, hey, by the way, have you done this? And my initial response, it didn't actually happen, but what I wanted to do, because I had been in a bad mood, had had a bad day, I wanted to ask her about her agreed upon chores. I wanted to say back, well, have you done this? And I had to catch myself and I had to realize, no, that's not the right thing. And instead I was able to, in this moment, have the strength and the wisdom to say, no, I haven't got it yet. And, and I went and took care of it. But as I was doing it, I was thinking about this idea of, of venting 
And even that term venting, what is it to vent? And we talk about venting. There are times we need to or want to vent. And, and it kind of was just playing in my mind as I was taking care of the, the task. And I was thinking about, well, venting is really when you have some form of um, c compression that is starting to get to the point where it's about to explode. And in order to stop it, you need to release some of whatever that energy is. Usually, you know, think of heat. Think of if you have a engine that's getting too hot, you need to vent out some of that heat before it explodes. So this whole idea of venting is essentially trying to cool something down before a bad thing takes place. And when it comes to our human interactions with each other, there are good ways and there are bad ways to vent. The explosion is a bad thing. So we don't want to get to that point. Instead, we want to be able to vent in good, healthy ways. So for me to say something back, to say like, well, have you done this chore? That's, that's essentially being passive aggressive, and that is a very unhealthy way to vent. And it's not being honest and truthful, and I need to instead try to remember what it is I'm doing and why, and instead of lashing out and venting in an unhealthy way, I need to look for the healthy way, which is to be honest and to talk and to, to share and to be considerate and to recognize my own faults and flaws and where I'm at. So there are, there are healthy and unhealthy ways to do a lot of things. There, there are healthy and unhealthy ways to eat. There are healthy and unhealthy ways to, uh, to um, exercise. There are healthy and unhealthy ways to have fun. And I don't really have to give you examples of them because I'm pretty sure you know what the examples of healthy and unhealthy are. And a different way we can say it instead of saying healthy and unhealthy is we can say right and wrong. There's, there's a right way to be healthy and there's a wrong way. There's a right way to eat and a wrong way. There's a right way to exercise and a wrong way. There's a right way to have fun and a wrong way. There's a right way to vent and a wrong way. And we have to look for what that right way is. Because in that right way, there is the healthy way. Well, all that is to say that there is a right way, a healthy way, and a wrong way to understand who Jesus is, to understand who God is. And if we don't look at Jesus the right way, then unhealthy things happen. This past week, uh, was meeting with our vestry, our governing board at the church, and, and we were reading through some stuff, and somebody had asked me a question about Judas, and it was a great question, and, and talking about Judas, who betrays Jesus. If you go on to read more, what happens after that is Judas, uh, he gets 30 pieces of silver from the chief priest and, and the Pharisees and scribes, and he gets that essentially as blood money to go and betray Jesus. And then after Jesus is crucified, when he comes to recognize what actually happens, what the result was of his decision and his action, he can't bear it. He can't bear the guilt of what actually has taken place, what, what he set in motion. And he tries to give back the silver. And when they won't take it back, dealing with his guilt, he goes and he kills himself. He hangs himself. And the scripture has different accounts of it, whether he hangs himself or whether he falls uh, from a great height and burst. But whatever it may be, his end is not pleasant. And it, it's a, it's, he's tormented and tortured. So the question that the vestry member asked, and I thought a very good question was, didn't Judas know what was going to happen? Why did he do that? Well, and, and my answer is uh, kind of to turn it back and say, have you never made a bad decision and you knew what was going to happen? Have you ever done an action? You know it's not the right thing to do. You know there's going to be some form of consequence, but you go ahead and do it anyway. And sometimes there's different reasons why. Sometimes it's because you're hoping you get away with it. Sometimes it's because you're just not thinking about it or you're worried about the instant. I want to be happy now. Sometimes it's purely motivated by greed. And then you realize later on that that greed uh, is not going to lead you to peace and harmony in your life. And you have to start dealing with the repercussions of your greedy act. There are so many different reasons why we make bad choices, why we make unhealthy choices. And the same was true for Judas. There's things we can find. One is this. Judas, in my belief, and maybe I'm wrong, I don't think Judas had a healthy view of who Jesus was. I think he had a wrong view of who Jesus was. P. 
People thought that Jesus was going to be this triumphant political leader, that he was going to come in and get rid of the Romans and, and be the king of the Jews, the king of that area, the way that they expected it to be, a man of great power and influence. And there's a good chance that Judas was on the inside circle, that he was following Jesus, hoping that he would be able to be in the inner circle when Jesus becomes the king, when he becomes this great man. Judas will have the inside track. And now, Judas, or now Jesus is saying, that's not what's going to happen. What's going to happen is I'm going to die. And Judas sees that as weakness instead of strength. And he starts not liking what Jesus is saying. He starts not recognizing who Jesus is and what Jesus is doing. And one very big clue we have to that is when Judas, when Judas comes to betray Jesus in the garden. When he brings the soldiers with him, he goes up to Jesus and he calls him rabbi, which means teacher. By this point in time, many of the other disciples are calling Jesus Lord. They are recognizing who Jesus is and that Jesus is the Son of God. Still working to understand what that means, working to understand that that means he is God incarnate. But they know he is more than just simply rabbi, a teacher. Judas doesn't come to Jesus and say, Lord, he says rabbi, which shows me that he has a, less, a not high enough view of who Christ is. Paul's, uh, not Paul's, we don't know who the author is, I'm sorry, the letter to Hebrews. We don't know who wrote it. We don't know who the audience is, but we know what the book is about. And Hebrews is all about taking a earthly view, a human view of who Jesus is, and raising it up higher and loftier, that we are looking at an unhealthy view of who Christ is, and we need to step it up and look to a higher view of who he is. And the challenge that we run into is a lot of times there's arguments over what is healthy and what's not. If we talk about diets, there's always a new fad diet out there. And there's people who will argue one way or another whether it's healthy or whether it's not. Uh, you can look at the different diets that say eliminate carbohydrates and just eat on protein and fats. There are other diets that uh, say the opposite of that. There are so many diets that go different ways. And when you look at them, a lot of them end up having detrimental effects one way or another. We really haven't quite figured out when the truth is I think it's pretty simple to know that there, there's a diet that's actually, I refer to it as a Henry Rollins diet, where he says, eat less, eat better, move your body. And that's kind of it. And we know what healthy is. We know when we're eating right, when we're moving our bodies, when we're uh, eating less. We, we know what we're supposed to do when we're not being indulgent in the wrong ways, when we're not making unhealthy decisions. But unfortunately, there's that same confusion with, with Christ. There's that same confusion trying to understand who Jesus is, who God is. And a lot of people think they have a grasp on it, and they very strongly want to uh, share what their grasp is, what their understanding is. So it's kind of their way of saying, here's my diet of Scripture. Here's what I think works, and it's going to be great for everybody else, and you need to get on board with this. And they might not be open to the idea that they could be wrong. Judas was wrong. Peter was wrong. They stumbled on it. Peter stumbled on the idea of who Christ was, but he still didn't grab it enough. And the reason he didn't grasp it enough, how we know that, is because he denies him. He still, and he, he strongly says, I would never do that. And then he does. He was still struggling, trying to understand exactly who Christ is. I love the, uh, there's bookends in scripture. There's times where there's something said at the beginning and something else said at the end that kind of create a bookend of, of what's happening in the spot. And, and there's, there's definitely um, parallels. There are things that take place and something else takes place. And one of the brilliant ones that happens here is when Jesus says, when, when the priest asks Jesus, if you are the Messiah, he responds and says, I am. And they are so insulted by his blasphemy from the fact that he is willing to say this. They are so insulted that they display that insult by ripping open their, their garments, by burying their chest. It's, it's kind of a way of um, giving the bird, you know, that's our big insult nowadays with our physical gesture is raising your middle finger at somebody. Well, that was it back then. It was a way of saying that struck me in my heart that was so horrible. So they bare their chest and rip open their, their garment to say, what an insult, Jesus. What an insult to say that you're the son of God. 
So they crucify him. And when he dies, what happens in the temple? You see, in the temple, they had a place called the Holy of Holies. And it was the place in the front of the temple where they believed that God actually resides. That that is where God actually is. He's in the Holy of Holies. And because God is so holy, we can't be in his presence. So they had a veil. They had a cloth between the rest of the temple and the Holy of Holies. And when Jesus dies, that veil rips open. Almost as if God is saying, burying his chest, ripping his garment, saying, you want to talk about insult? Look at what you've just done. There's more symbolism to that, too. When we have to think of Jesus in a higher place and who he is. Jesus is the bridge, the mediator, the connection between us and God. He is the way, the truth, and the light. When that veil rips open, there's no longer a barrier between the Holy of Holies and the people. There's no longer a veil that blocks us between our access of ourselves and God. Jesus removes that veil. He becomes our great mediator, our great high priest, our one sacrifice. Here's the problem. We still don't know it. We still don't understand who he is and what he did. And we still make unhealthy choices. Why would Judas do this? Didn't he know what the outcome was going to be? How many times do we do something knowing it's wrong, knowing the outcome won't be great? And we do it anyway. We are called to try to live righteously, rightly, healthy lives. But when we fall short of that, and we do, and I do, and you do, when we fall short of that, I am so comforted by a high view of Christ, of knowing that he's not just simply a teacher, but he is God incarnate, God made man, who fulfilled the purpose of eliminating the barrier between us and God, of creating a way for us when we fall short through his perfection and his sacrifice to be able to be embraced by God. I want to invite you to join us for an observation of Holy Week. Jesus triumphantly enters into Jerusalem and days later is crucified and killed. The people didn't know who they had. They didn't know what they had. They didn't have a high enough view of him and what he was going to do and how. Let us take time this week to remember that and to look for ways in our own lives that we are not giving him a high enough view. And let's do that in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Spread 
I hope you enjoyed our worship this morning, the message, the call to worship that Adamir put together and all the hymns. I hope you uh, have found it to be enlightening, uplifting, and enriching. Um, we will have a few announcements about services coming up after this. I'm going to go ahead and close us with a prayer. But before, uh, after that, in a few moments, there will be more that talks about some of the services and announcements we're going to have this week in our service. We also are continuing to uh, have drive-through communion on Sundays at 11.15. So if you would like communion, come on down to the church and in the parking lot. I come out after our service and we'll have communion. And today, if you want, I can give you a palm cross to keep with you on this Palm Sunday through Holy Week and maybe even to next year we'll get together again on Ash Wednesday with us. I hope you have a blessed week. I hope you find one blessing after another and an encounter with God this week and that through those encounters your view of who God is in your life will be lifted up and made higher than any expectation you can have. Until then, may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. All right, so we are having Holy Week services this week. We are going to have in-person services. We'll have a Monday, Thursday service. We will have a Good Friday service. We will have Stations of the Cross on Good Friday, too. And we are going to have our Easter vigil on Saturday evening. Uh, so all those services, I'm going to put the times for them up so you can see them and where they are. They are in-person services. We will also have different online options available this week as well. So we're going to have a couple different services options for you online. Uh, we'll have an online version of Stations of the Cross. We'll have an online version of the Easter Vigil. And we are actually also going to have an online option for the Vigil. So the Vigil is this. On Monday, Thursday, on, on Thursday we do a service. And at the end of the service, it, it's supposed to represent the Last Supper at that service. And usually we do the washing of feet. We're not doing that this year. Uh, but usually we do. And then at the end of the service, we kind of do something that's like a representation of the disciples going into the garden. Uh, and the whole thing that happens in the garden is the disciples you know Jesus goes to pray the disciples fall asleep and Jesus says you couldn't stay awake with me even one hour so a tradition in the church kind of like the palms is on Monday Thursday we do an overnight vigil where people where people in the church each sign up for a different hour and they come and sit in a chapel a place in the church set apart uh, and they spend an hour awake in prayer uh, over Monday Thursday night well we're not doing an in-person version of that but I am going to have an online one so what that means is we're going to release a online uh, hour-long devotional time on Monday Thursday for you and anyone who wants to to be able to watch and use so you can take an hour of time to sit and pray and be with Christ so please do look for and take advantage of the different options we're going to have available you can find them on our YouTube page on our Facebook page and if you have any questions please do email the church office uh, it's info at saintmaryangels.org or you can always call the church office it's 407-855-1930 i hope you have a blessed week and we will see you soon